If I stayed at the firm for another 10 years, I probably would have made five to $7 million. My math with HostWise has been, I can build this to a 500 to a thousand unit business and sell this business for 30 to 50 million. You were in private equity for more than 10 years. You left what a lot of people consider to be a dream job to get started in vacation rentals. I think there's a difference between being a visionary and being a dreamer. If you're a visionary, you need someone to help you achieve your goals together. What are you doing differently that has allowed you to maintain that 4.91 average review score even with 100 plus properties? I operate seven of the top 10 highest revenue properties in my market, 100 to $125,000 a year on these properties. We have good systems in place. We can keep our quality. So now it's where do we go next? All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hospitality Edge podcast, where we bring together what we think are two sides of the same coin, real estate and hospitality. This podcast is meant to bring uh, operators, entrepreneurs, investors, and, and overall operators uh, so that they can tell us about their stories uh, and the lessons that they have learned along the way, as well as perhaps some of the mistakes that they have made and the lessons that have come from that too, so that you don't have to make those same mistakes. Today, I'm excited to have Chad Weiss, the founder at hostwise.co with us today. Chad, how are you doing? I'm good. Happy to be here. Thank, thank you so much for being here. And yes, very excited to have you on. So Chad, you have a very interesting background. You 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 were in private equity for more than, than 10 years. You left what a lot of people uh, consider to be a dream job to 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 get started in 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 this entrepreneurship world in 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 vacation rentals. Tell us a little bit about about you and your background and 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 how you got into uh, into hospitality. So I got into this, I think, like a lot of people in the short term rental world do. It's kind of by accident, you know. I. As you said, I was a consultant in private equity. I've spent 15 years in consulting, 10 years uh, at my last firm um, <clears throat> doing private equity consulting. So I was the 40th person in our group. Uh, my, you know, my firm's a multi-billion dollar firm, but we were the market leaders in private equity consulting. When I left, there was about 400 of us. I was on a partner track. I was a director whenever I left. You know, this is $800 bill rate hour work. You know, this is a job that you have to try really hard to get. And frankly, I stumbled into it, got really lucky. Uh, I got a chem and bio double major from a branch of a state school on paper. I'm wholly unqualified to do what I was doing. But, uh, you know, I was good at what I did. I was advising, you know, the C-level um, primarily in the procurement space. But, you know, I did a little bit of everything at the firm. Um, you know, when I left, I was getting more into the the C level uh, positions, just doing. Um, you know, I was the the interim chief procurement officer of a four hundred million dollar coffee roaster, a billion dollar food distribution company. So this was a this was a job that, on paper, I shouldn't have left. Um, <clears throat> I got into short term rentals as a side hustle. Um, <clears throat> my my ex and I in two thousand sixteen broke up, and I had a house, and as you know. How am I going to pay for this mortgage? And I was like, well, I travel for work all the time anyway. So might as well start uh, renting my house out while I'm traveling. So I was traveling Monday through Thursday, 45 weeks a year. So I started doing that, started learning how it works. And I was like, well, this is easy money. Uh, then I got a house in Steamboat Springs as a ski house. And that was my first dedicated STR. And then I was talking to an old college buddy and he told me about his friend who was a lawyer who recently quit and started his own short-term rental company, and he was making millions. And I was like, how the heck did he do that? And he's like, well, I don't know. He's like, you should talk to him. So I talked to him, and uh, he told me about this little thing called arbitrage, which at the time I had never heard about before. I was like, that's freaking genius. So I got my first arbitrage property in Pittsburgh in 2018, and Pittsburgh's my hometown. And uh, then it just started growing from there. The my system was kind of built on the fact that I had zero time to actually do this. So I, you know, I'm a quick learner. I have pattern recognition and I couldn't very well be sitting in a boardroom and tell the CEO, Hey, wait a minute. My guest can't get in the door. I've got to, you know, I've got to step away. Like that's not a thing. So from the very beginning, from my first two STRs, I had to have a really strong system in place and try to proactively answer questions before they were asked. So I didn't have 
issues, right? And that just kept growing. Um, you know, COVID happened and we started, I started picking up more properties because I had time, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies weren't, you know, they didn't want to spend the money on consultants because they didn't know what was going to happen in the world. So I could have used my time to do nothing, but instead I built a website, started looking for, you know, looking for properties. Frankly, I was doing arbitrage, like looking for landlords to do arbitrage and convert them into doing SDR. And I started having, uh, people reach out to me asking if we could manage their stuff too. And, Come, uh, you know, February 2021, I talked to my, my, you know, kind of partner in this and, and I was like, holy crap, like we have a business here. And, uh, I made the decision in May of 21 to leave the firm with, I had 22 units under management. And, you know, three years later, we have uh, about 105 now with 15 in our pipeline. So it's been a, it's been rapid growth and lots to learn along the way. Right, 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 right. So from 20 to, yeah, 100 plus properties in three years. We'll we'll dive into how that growth took place. But before that, I just want to zoom in on that decision for you to leave this job, right? Which, uh, to your point earlier, like it's on paper, not a job that you leave. So how yeah. did that how did that happen? What was the thought process? And, and so, yeah, so man, kind of, how did you get to that conclusion? It's kind of funny. I, I met I met somebody in the industry on, on Facebook, just, uh, I forget. We were looking for, looking for like new cleaners or something like that. And I, I struck up a conversation with a guy and, you know, he was telling me about this, this Facebook group that he was in, a professional operators group. Uh, and he invited me to it. There's only like 75 people in this group and it's, it's a very, it's a small network and it stayed small. Um, but I consider some of these folks, my, my friends at this point, we, we you know, we're all competitors into the day, but we were all in the same industry and we do a lot of knowledge sharing. Um, but back in like March of 21, whenever I met him, he invited me to this group. And I, you know, my first post in the group was, am I insane? Because I'm going to walk away from a, you know, within five years, seven figure job to do short term rentals. I'm like, this is stupid, right? Like I shouldn't do this. And, uh, you know, multiple people in the group are like, one guy's like, yeah, I was a lawyer and I quit. One guy's like, yeah, I'm in medicine and now I do short term rentals. Another guy was like, I've got a great job with the feds, but I'm leaving that to do this. So it's kind of like you're crazy, but you should definitely do it. Uh, so I, you know, I talked to my, my business partner and said, and she was, you know, she was a partner in that she was managing my properties in Pittsburgh because I live in Denver full time. And, uh, you know, I was in Pittsburgh a lot, but, uh, I told her, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm only going to do it if you, if you do it with me. And she came back and said, let's do it. So that, but that group of individuals was my, you know, they were my push. If they would have said, you know what, that's pretty insane. You should wait a little bit longer. I don't know. I don't know if I would have done it or not, but that just, you know, I was looking for validation, right? And as a consultant, that's half of what we used to do as consultants. Like the C-level would bring us in because they wanted our advice, but they also wanted to justify their decision. So I was kind of using this group for a little bit of justification, probably. That's interesting. Now, in terms of the timing of that, I mean, you you mentioned that when you left the firm, you, you did have 22 properties already. So uh, uh, were you at a point where you had you know, replace your W two income. We're on track no, to replacing I'm still it. Not. Like, no, I the, my math was like if I stayed at the firm for another ten years, I probably would have made five to seven million dollars. I would guess. Um, my math with host wise has been, I can build this to a five hundred to a thousand unit business and sell this business for thirty to fifty million. Like that's the goal. I've always been the type that has had a you know, a, a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. You know, when I was, when I was 22, I wanted to make a hundred K by the time I was 30 and I, I hit that goal. And then I set a goal of retiring by 45. I don't know that I'm going to hit that one, but I'll be financially independent by 45. Um, I've always kind of joked that I want a big yacht to disappear on. So that's like kind of my next goal. But, um, I think everybody needs to set borderline unrealistic goals because if you set reasonable goals, like, it's kind of like when I think about running, not that I'm a big runner, but if you run, like, and if you aim for a stopping point, like you kind of just run to that stopping point and that's it. You got to keep moving that goalpost. Uh, mm -hmm. cause if you don't, you get static. 
it's not for everybody. Um, but I've always been the type to, you know, a little bit of arrogance and that I can, I can do it. You know, why, why can't I, if other people were doing it, then I can do it too. So I always set a, you know, a big, a big goal out in front somewhere. It's, it's gotta think- be, you gotta be able to see it still, you know, like it's gotta be a goal that you can see. It might be really far in the distance, but you know, if you set a goal, it's like, I want to be a billionaire by that time I'm 30. Like it's probably, you're going to get defeated real fast. But if you have a goal that is audacious, but possible, like that's a, that's a good angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, and I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits to having such audacious goals. I mean, from one it's, it's, it's motivating, right? Because you're, you're reaching for something that's, that's hard, that's far away. Uh, I mean, some people might might say if it's too if it's too audacious, you can do, have the opposite effect. But that's where you want to be like audacious enough where you can still see it, right? Yeah. And then the other one, I think, is you know talent att- att- attracting you know top talent. Like they, there's a saying where like your your goal or your vision as a leader needs to be large enough so that it can fit the vision of all of your team members within that vision, right? So I think that th- there's also that argument when it comes yeah. to this this concept of, of having a large vision. And with that, I think there's a difference between being a visionary and being a dreamer. You know, like I, I think you can they're similar, but like someone that that is a visionary, like you see out front and you see what's possible versus a dreamer that come up with big ideas. Both of those things can be successful. I think having a number two that can ground you is important. Mm-hmm. Like a dreamer to me is just like floating off into space and you got to have someone firmly wrapped around your legs to hold you to the ground a little bit. Uh, if you're a visionary, I think you, you can, see, you know, you're looking into the future and you see the opportunity. You need someone to be your sounding board and maybe pump your brakes a little bit, but you know, they, they help you achieve your goals to, together. Yeah. The visionary and the integrator. Yeah. 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 No, that, that makes sense. Now tell me something just just to conclude on that so what what was the analysis like like when when you when you go in and say okay i can i can scale this to this size and 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 i can sell this for you know uh this can be a 50 million dollar business like how much how much analysis or due diligence do you do before leaving again such a such a comfortable job like how like was there a moment where you were like okay this is possible like this yeah, is the business i you know being a ex consultant i'm a i'm a spreadsheet junkie so i built myself a model and mm-hmm. tried to figure out okay my margins are going to be x and uh you know i need i think this is going to cost me this much you know our but our business has changed even since then you know i i was a low you know i was a, a lower margin or lower markup business with lower quality. And what we learned really even in the first six months of me leading the firm when I went from working five hours a week on Hostwise to a hundred hours a week on Hostwise was, okay, we don't want to be, we don't want to be in this affordable market. We want to be like the, the top tier in the short term rental space because we were, we were a really high quality operator whenever we started. Um, as far as our quality scores, like I had a 4.93 with about 800 reviews. And everybody told me as I got bigger that we would inevitably drop in reviews because it is not possible to scale at our quality level. And my response was then and is now, I said, I think you're full of it. Like, I think it is possible. I think you're just not good at operations. You know, we have a, we have a, uh, over 11,000 reviews now, I think pushing 12,000 and we still have a 4.93 rating. So quality is, is kind of where we hang our hats. And when I was, you know, circling back, but when I was building my model, my entire plan was if I keep the quality up, we find good properties. I know a recession is going to happen eventually. And I know market saturation is going to happen eventually. And why would anybody book a 4.6 when a 4.9 exists? And we're seeing that in the market now. Like, you know, Airbnb rolled out their guest favorites and there is more saturation. And if you have a tier two or tier three property, frankly, you can have a tier one property, but if you're crappy at managing that property, people don't book it. So that went into my model as far as like, I think that we can continue to hold our, our revenue per property and continue to hold this, you know, at this particular margin. 
and um, just kind of worked your way into the math. You know, I did a lot of in consulting, you know, in addition to procurement, I, I was on what's called ODDs, Operational Due Diligence, which was always in conjunction of it with an FDD, which is a financial due diligence. So, you know, I'm in the books of billion dollar companies and I, the ODD part, I kind of called flipping over rocks to look for money. You're looking for landmines and money. So um, I knew how multiples work. I knew how EBITDA work. So I could kind of come up with what I think a multiple could be for this business. And obviously talking to others in the business and figuring out how much revenue I have to have in order to sell this business for, you know, $30 million. Uh, Cause you could have 500 units, but if those units really bring in $25,000 a year, it's very different than if you're operating in like Aspen or Vail in properties that are bringing in $250,000, $300,000 a year. Mm-hmm. We started in Pittsburgh as a Rust Belt kind of operator, but that was, Purely just to prove that we could do this, frankly, in a market. I operate seven of the top 10 highest revenue properties in my market. And these are just barely squeaking through six figures. You know, it's a hundred to $125,000 a year on these properties. But mm-hmm. We've learned a lot of fast lessons and, you know, we're reaching the point where, okay, we've proven it to ourselves at this scale. We have good systems in place. We can keep our quality. So now it's, where do we go next? So we're just starting to look into these other markets, but obviously I can't be a single city operator with a $30 million company. It would be stupid, mm-hmm. even if I could have that many properties in my market. It's too much attention, and inevitably, you're exposing your business to way too much risk. Like, no one's going to buy a business that only operates in one city, because as we all know in this industry, the government can change the rules on you tomorrow, and suddenly your business disappeared. Now, when when you look at the experience you've had scaling this to to more than a hundred properties, versus the versus the original assumptions that you were doing on that spreadsheet when you were crunching numbers and doing your due diligence. Other than you know you just mentioned like the, the focus of going towards higher end properties is something that has shifted. What what would you say are other things that are perhaps um, assumptions you had back then when you were just looking at the numbers that you are now realizing that perhaps those assumptions were not accurate or had to be thought of differently? Like what, what are some of those things that when you look back at our, that that original thesis, you're like, okay, this I would have had to calculate or, or uh, anticipate in a different way? I think the biggest thing that I didn't expect, it wasn't really from a model perspective um, as, as far as like revenue and profit and things like that. Uh, I think the the thing that I was most unrealistic about was how freaking hard it is to be an entrepreneur and build a business from scratch. You know, we were running this business out of my out of my uh, partner's garage for the first year and a half, and it was it was her and I and some cleaners. And you know, to scale to a hundred units and keep that quality score up, like it's, I knew it was going to be a lot of work, but I did not fully anticipate like. You know, working as a consultant 60 hours a week was not really a big deal. Like that was just easy. Uh, so I figured I can handle this running my own business. I did not fully anticipate, okay, this is actually a, a basically 24-7, 365 kind of job to to make that happen. So I was definitely, I was unrealistic about that. Um you know, we've raised our we've raised our commission structure as we've grown. Like when I first built my model, it was uh, you know only seventeen percent, and I was like, I can do this. But as we learn, uh, we want to be more of a quality focus and and higher end service because you have better guests that way. Like we charge a little bit higher in our market than others, and you know it works. Like we ran at a sixty. I think 63% occupancy in January. And I always joke like, who the hell wants to go to Pittsburgh in January? The, the market was only 23% uh, or something like that. So we, we killed it because, you know, we were cheap, but we were, we weren't so cheap that we were, you know, running the risk of having bad guests. Um, but people were booking that because our reviews say like, this is the best, you know, this is the best Airbnb experience I've ever had. Like, this is the nicest place I've ever stayed in. Like, our reviews just reflect that. And that is from me using, you know, we use drops detergent in our places. We're using seventh generation. We're using who gives a crap toilet paper. Like, we're using high quality products in all of our properties. And guests walk in and say that. Like, I've kind of said, even before I quit the firm, like, our unofficial motto is walk in and say, wow. Like, I want those guests to walk in the door. And the very first thing is like, you know, 
I won't use the other words that I say, but it's like, holy crap, this is freaking nice. Like, I want mm-hmm. guests to do that because this industry, when you go to a hotel, you kind of know what to expect, right? Like, you know, you've got a 300 square foot room. You kind of, you, you, you know what you're walking into. In the short term rental space, there's a lot of I hope. I mean, I know I'm guilty of that. If I book a short term rental, like, I hope it's clean. I hope my key works. I hope it's nice as it is as the pictures. Like, mm-hmm. I hope they're available if I need something. That is absolutely insane to me. I've never checked into a Weston and have been like, man, I, I hope that they have a room for me. Like, it's just, it's, it's just, it's a known entity. And we've built Hostwise as the same kind of standard. Now, Chad, why do you think most operators eventually get to a point where they just conclude that it's just impossible or unrealistic to keep up with that kind of quality at scale? And what have you figured out or what are you doing differently that has allowed you to maintain that 4.91 average review score even with 100 plus properties? I think there's a couple reasons. I mean, I think part of it is just I'm a I'm an operator currently in a in a rust belt city. You know, Pittsburgh has come a long ways. It's a great city and you know anybody listening should definitely check it out. It's not the it's not the rust belt that it used to be. I mean, it's a great it's a great town. Um, but you know, it's it's primarily a drive-in destination. Like I think 65, 70% of guests that come into Pittsburgh are driving in. These aren't super wealthy people coming in. It's a lot more blue collar, a lot more people that are connected to the city. And, you know, your average American only has 10, 10 days off per year. And we've taken the mindset from the very beginning that like, you know, if somebody books a three day, three day long weekend and we don't provide them a great time um, or some stuff goes wrong. Like I just ruined 10% of their vacation time. And that, that sucks. You know, like, we're in the hospitality business. We are, our job is to give people positive memories. Like, I don't want to be like one of these people you read about online that is like, I'll never stay in an Airbnb again because dot, dot, dot. You know, things go wrong. We, everybody knows that. Like, I'm, we are by no means perfect. Things break, you know, animals get into the trash the night before a guest checks in. It really comes down to how you react to that. I think a lot of operators, especially in the last three or four years, they have focused on growth rather than quality. Like, even though we've grown fast, we've been extremely selective. Like, I could easily be twice the size that I am, but I turn down most properties. Like, we turn down about 80% of what comes to us um, because they're just not a good fit. Either wrong location, wrong house. Like, it feels like a rental instead of a home. So we're really particular about that. A lot of people have just taken whatever they could. Uh, because, you know, they were, they were just chasing growth and that has backfired, I think, spectacularly on a lot of people because once you start having problems everywhere, you get defeated and then you, you get to that point, I think, where you're just like, you don't care as much as you used to and, or you don't have time to circle back to your properties you've had for three years and make sure they're staying fresh. No, we have, we have a little bit higher payroll, I think, than a lot of operators. Like our, we have junior, we call them junior ops managers who are responsible for a subset of properties. And their job is that, you know, they're in there every 45 to 60 days stocking them. Like a lot of people use their cleaners to do stocking, but then you don't have checks and balances. Like my, my uh, junior ops managers are making sure that the houses still look good. We, you know, our cleaners let us know generally we've got a really strong cleaning teams, but um, having that second and even third set of eyes on a property is important because if suddenly everything starts spiraling. Like if you launched 20 properties three years ago and you haven't done much to them, all of a sudden those properties are starting to go south and now you've got a mess and now you're getting delisted because your property has has problems. So we are we are constantly paying attention to that kind of stuff. We're not, you know, obviously we're not buying reviews. We're not, we're not paying guests off if they have a problem. Like I give, I give less than $500 a month in refunds, which over 600 properties is, is, I mean, it's literally nothing. If we screw up, we own it. Um, you know, if, if we screw up and the guest doesn't ask for anything, like I don't offer money, you know, it's really how you react to a guest. Like if you fall on the sword a little bit and be like, I'm sorry, we missed that. Like, let us get over there and fix it. Or, 
hey, it looks like the air conditioner crapped the bed. Like I can have HVAC over there in uh, in eight hours and we get it, you know, we get it taken care of. Sometimes you can't fix things, but the guest is like, hey, I get it. Like I own a house too. I know things fall apart. It's really just that reaction. Mm-hmm. So, so you talked about being selective with your owners. You talked about having a checks and balances sort of approach where someone other than the cleaner will super, supervise the quality uh, of, 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 of the property and make sure everything is up to date. And of course, the, 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 the responsiveness, like how fast you are to, to, res- to respond to guest issues. Now, a lot of people might hear that and say, okay, in theory, all of that makes sense. But then we get to the same challenge of like, okay, how do you maintain that as you scale, right? Because a lot of people yeah. can do that when it's one property, you know, that, that that's easy to do with one property, but with a hundred, what is it that you, like, did you, did you feel like you went through stages where after so many properties, you realized like, okay, whatever we were trying to do to maintain quality with 20 properties is no longer going to work now that we have 60. So we need to change or. Yeah. I've, I've, uh, so it's a great question. I, when, even before I left the firm, um, I would always challenge my team and say, you know, when we had 20 properties, how we're going to do, how are we going to do this? And they would give an answer. I'd be like, okay, but can you do that with 50 properties? Can you do that with a hundred properties? Can you do that with 500 properties? Mm-hmm. If the answer is no anywhere along that line, then that's probably not the right solution. You know, our kind of goalpost then though was around a hundred units. I figured if we could get to a hundred units, like growing from a hundred to five hundred wasn't going to be as hard. Like adding five units on right now, like I don't I don't even think about it. I don't notice it. The system doesn't change. But going from twenty units to fifty units is is hard. I think a lot of operators that are smaller, you it's it's a struggle once you try to get over 20 because you're, you're stretched pretty thin. You know, you, maybe you, maybe you've hired your first VA somewhere to help you with messaging a little bit, but once you're getting into that 30 range, like you really need to hire somebody, but now you don't have the money to hire somebody. Uh, so you kind of have to, you've, you've got to make a decision. Either you're working for free for a little while, or you just don't grow past that size, or you look for a, a partner, um, you know, I'm lucky in that I had the benefit of having a strong career and having a nest egg. Like I was able to invest in this business and use my money to push me over the hump. We've always been profitable. There's never been a year where we haven't turned profit, but I also don't pay myself very much because I can afford to do that. Like I'm, I'm using, I only own nine doors. Uh, We do arbitrage still of about 25 doors and the rest are managed. My nine doors provide me enough cash flow um, that I can kind of survive. I'm making 80% less than I used to as a consultant, but it's the bigger picture. You know, it's selling this business at the end. Like I could be pulling money out of the business now, but I'm using that money to continue to invest in it. But, mm-hmm. you know, your, your smaller operators, people that are just kind of starting out, like you have two properties, you think this is easy. You have five properties, this is still easy. This is that, you know, that so-called passive income that everybody on the internet guru talks about. And then you get to 10 properties and it's like, oh shit, this is getting a little hard. Then you hit 20 and it's like, Ooh, what am I doing here? You, you kind of start having that imposter syndrome a little bit, I think. And then you get over that hump and if you can make it to 50, you know, that's the next level where it's like, you're, you really got to start looking at your systems. Like we've had We've used software, software since I've had three properties, you know, like using a PMS and then, okay, this PMS can't do this. So then I'm using a sauna and then a sauna is too small. So then I have to switch to a new software. And then you're, you're looking at how you're managing your finances. Like you just have to keep looking for solutions to solve the problems that are popping up, but trying to plan for those before they're problems. You know, I think I, I was talking to my team about not software per se, but talking about staffing and hiring people. I think one of the mistakes that we've made in the past is we have hired people when we needed them, but by the time we needed them and found them, it was past needing them. So it has sucked because that means you're carrying that weight. Uh, and we have done that for the last three years straight. It's like, okay, I need an accountant, but I needed an accountant six months ago, a kind of thing. Like, so now it's like, 
what do we need? What do we need six months from now? What do we need 12 months from now? Let's start thinking about that now and start looking for those people, potentially start interviewing for them because we're going to continue to grow. It's different if you're not a rapid growth company like us, but we know we're going to continue to grow. It doesn't mean I'm going to throw money away, but if I could have hired, you know, to do this over again, if I would have hired an accountant like a year before, I would have been in a much better, more comfortable position than I am now where I'm behind the ball and I'm like, you know, trying to carry too much weight that uh, I should have been a little bit more perceptive of. But, you know, this is, this business is easy to get in the weeds. There is no such thing as a day off in the short-term rental world. Like, you can take a day off if you if you want, but that, that doesn't stop. You don't have weekends, you know. Like, Tuesday is as close as I get to a weekend. <laughs> that's, that's a very good point you just made there because – this dilemma between overstaffing and understaffing is, is I think, uh, something very common, right? You don't want to hire. You start as a small in business, advance. you know. Mm-hmm. Like end of the day, like almost all of us in this industry are small businesses. There's very few large businesses in the short term rental space, partially because I know it's not a new industry, but in a lot of ways it is. Like there's been vacation homes like Verbos for thirty years, but with Airbnb coming out and just the technology out there, like you don't have to be an operator of beach town anymore. You can be a national company. And that, that really didn't exist 20 years ago. You were a hotel chain back then, but having the operations to expand was, was hard. And even now, like my personal opinion is if you're an operator with a hundred units in 50 cities, like you cannot be, you cannot be super successful with that. You can for a time, but I think the headaches are going to continue to grow exponentially because you can't really have those true boots on the ground in those markets. So we've been very strategic since the beginning of we're going to start in one market. We're going to grow in this market and learn our lessons here so that we can build a business model that we can then lift and shift in the other markets. So. That's where we're at now. You know, we've got a couple of properties in a few other kind of test markets, which we're using like, okay, how do we, how do we virtually kind of stage this place? Like, how do we manage this thing remotely with the, with the cleaners? Like, how often do we have to go there? Like, how do we do inventory counts remotely? So, because there's a lot of software out there. It's like, oh, well, you know, our cleaners, they'll take pictures and you can validate how clean it is based on that. And like, you can't tell anything from that. Like, but, it's like, if I'm a cleaner, I'm not going to take a picture of the toilet that I bothered to skip, right? I'm not going to take a picture under the bed that I didn't clean under. Like, you're just not, you're not going to. Like, you're only going to take, it's like, it's just like us. Like, I'm not going to take a picture. Of, I'm not going to take a selfie on my worst day. I mean, I might, but probably not, right? Mm-hmm. So then how do you, well, two questions. There. Number one, let's start with, with this. How did you know it was time to open up a new market? Like, how did you know you were there? Uh, mostly I would say they, it kind of fell into our lap a little bit. Like the particular markets I'm in now are either clients of mine in my current market, or they were friends of mine that had a place that are more, they could kind of be the boots on the ground a little bit. Like I'm giving them a really good deal on management fees because they're there and they can kind of, you know, drive across the city to check it out. So it's, it's less risk that way. Um, so I've got a couple in Austin, Texas, because it's one of my old consulting buddies who, you know, he's got a couple properties there and he wants to try it out. So kind of a low risk for us there. And then I've got a couple in the Colorado mountains because that's only an hour away from me here in Denver. I can drive up there if I need to and, you know, keep eyes on things. Um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of the approach that we've taken. Like I would not pick up properties in a place where it's an owner that doesn't live in that town that is in the middle of nowhere kind of thing because I, the quality aspect of it and being a good host is really important to us. And it makes me too nervous to, to drop the ball. But there's a lot of people out there that are just purely looking at the numbers and they're going on air DNA or something like that and being like, Oh, this property is going to cash flow really well. And they'll buy properties or take properties on purely based on that. But in a couple of years, like those properties are falling apart. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Now there's that. And then now that you are in those other markets where you're not there physically, well, you mentioned that you, you do try to partner up in, in some way with, with someone that's local, right? That's, that's going to be your boots on the ground. Um, like 
what else have you found uh, you know in terms of making that work? I mean, you were you were giving the example of the cleaner that won't take a picture of the 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 toilet they didn't clean, right? So how have you mm-hmm. managed to maintain that quality in in markets that are not yours? It, it kind of comes down to what I said a few minutes ago. If you have a couple properties, it's easy. So if you only have two properties in a market, like this is kind of an odds game, right? Like the odds of something going wrong are pretty low. If you have a hundred properties, the odds of something going wrong, if, if it's a 1% chance, that's one property you have a problem with per time. If you have a 1% chance and you have two properties, you got some runway there. So our kind of math is we're going to stick our toe in the water in these markets make sure we understand them and the numbers, you know, the, the numbers work. We like the, we like the guest profile. Um, if that all works, we're going to, we're going to open up operations there. Like we're going to send, you know, I'm going to send my COO down there and we're going to look for someone to hire and we're going to potentially look for a, you know, a small operator there, you know, one of those 20, 20 business or 20 property type people and say, Hey, your life probably kind of sucks now, right? Like this is, this is hard now. You're stuck let us help you. I'll hire that person as an employee and then incent them to go find more properties. And they can instantly bolt onto our system, like absorbing 20 properties. Like, you know, the PMS transition is probably the hardest part of it, but everything else, bolting them into our systems and processes, like we've built the manuals, we've built the training programs, we've built the brand. Like finding owners is easy. Like I go to Verma and things like that. And I swear half of these conferences are about like, how do you get more clients? And I'm like, how do I stop them from bothering me? Because I'm getting too many leads. Like I get five leads a week and they're not just Pittsburgh anymore. Like people are finding us uh, from other markets and it's just, Hey, I'll put you on the list. We're not in that market yet, but we might be. Um, never spend a nickel on marketing. Like literally never spend a dollar on, on owner acquisition at this point. So the way that I, the way that I want to grow this is really like starting to look for those operators that are, that are good. They care. They like what they do, but they're stuck. Um, cause they don't want to go out and hire somebody. Maybe they don't want to be, a, you know, they don't want to be a boss. You know, there's, there's different, there's different people out there and different skill sets. So it's looking for those people because every market out there has probably 50 hosts that are 20 plus properties i would make, so you buy them I, you buy them at, at that point you acquire them and, and then you hire yeah, them but and, and, my opinion is i don't i don't really want to acquire a, an operator because their business really isn't worth that much you know like what i offer them is a is you know my thing and i haven't done this yet so this is hypothetical but you know because we're just reaching this point now but if somebody is making seventy five thousand a year net on their 20 properties after all their costs and everything um I can give them a salary that's that and better, but then say I can give you, you know, X thousands of dollars per year for each property we get after that. And you can use the strength of the Hostwise brand and the fact that we have a 493 with 11,000 reviews to help you grow. So I can help you go from that 75K to 175K in the next three years because we're going to pick up more properties in your market. And we're going to do just what I did in my first market in your market. So mm-hmm. I, there's like acquiring them, their business, you know, the business is only worth what they, what they are worth. Like there's a lot of people that think their businesses are worth, worth more than they are. I mean, frankly, myself included, I think I'd struggle to sell my business for any meaningful money right now as a, you know, a hundred unit business. Um, so someone that has 20 units, like your business really isn't, it's not really worth much. Like if you're, if you disappear for a month, your business disappears in a week. Like probably less, right? So the thinking is those are the people that become your employees that you help them grow. It's not for everybody. Some people they only want to be an entrepreneur. But what's nice about this industry is you know you don't really have a boss, you know. It's not like someone is checking that you're sitting at your desk for eight hours a day. Like it's really metrics focused. It's what are your what are your review scores? What are your cleaning scores? Like what are your what are your guests saying? Like that's that's our metric. If your guests are bitching, you're not doing a good job. Like simple as that. Mm-hmm. And there's certainly, I think, a lot of truth in in what you said about like if you are running a solo operation, a handful of properties, and the business depends completely on you. That's not a business, right? If you right. If you leave, uh, the business is gone. And so, of course, having a business that can run without the founder. 
is one of the elements that's required to have a business that's worth something, that's sellable. Yeah. What do you think are other elements that m can make a property management company actually valuable and actually sellable? Like, is there a minimum critical mass that you think uh, a property management operation needs to have? I um, think three years ago, it was a lot different story than it is now. Like, there was a lot of free money floating around and short-term rentals were popular. You had some private equity toes dipping in the water. But unfortunately, uh, you know, won't name names, but a couple of these large public companies that are out there that are now worth 99% less than they were three years ago has made a lot of investors very nervous, even though their, my opinion, their mistakes are not, uh, people should learn lessons from those, but that's not the business model that everybody has out there. Like you can still have a very successful short-term rental business, but I think, I think if you have a $5 million business, you're going to have a real tough time selling that unless it's to another, you know, company in this space, but they're, you know, you're, you're not going to get these, big multiples, like I think were kind of happening back in the day. And, you know, private equity, We I work primarily with $150 million to a billion dollar in size companies. And we were looking at typically like a 10x EBITDA multiplier. So if you're, your company is bringing in 10 million EBITDA, then, you know, they were, they're going to buy that company for 100 to 120 million. But when you get into these small companies, there's just a lot more risk involved. So if you're getting multiples of even like four to six, you're doing, you're doing well. And the smaller you get, you know, the investors know that that business kind of hinges on you. So as an employee, you know, the goal is always to make yourself invaluable so you can't get fired. But as an entrepreneur, the goal is to make yourself worthless so you can take your fat check and go away. You know, if you're the, if, if you're the reason that they buy your company, you can never get away. Like private equity, if, if you get bought by private equity, like they're going to handcuff you and make you stay for five years to get any value out of that business. Like they'll give you some money and they'll dangle a big carrot in front of you. But if you don't keep working your ass off, like you get, you potentially get nothing at the end of it or very, very little. Unless you build this in a way where you're not the right. But a lot of, you know, doesn't depend on you. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, private equities, I got a love hate relationship with that. I know how these people think and how they operate their businesses. Like if they buying a company and even, even three times my size, like they're, they're not going to want to let me go away unless I really, really prove how good of a job I've done handing stuff off. And you can do that. You know, you can be that visionary leader that has built a really solid brand and hired the right people, you know, get the right people on your bus and have them believe in what you're doing. And then, you know, they're believing in the brand and not and not you. Mm -hmm. now, not just you. Tell me something, Chad. What is different about starting a company and, and, and scaling it, especially at these early stages, when you have that big vision in mind of of like this is this is going to be worth 50 million like how has your role as a ceo evolved you know since you started and 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 how is that unique to the fact that you're trying to make this a scalable business rather than just to replace your you know, income at my size i I don't think it's changed that much yet. I would like it to change more. I mean, I think the first big move that I made, which I think is hard, it was hard for me at least, is giving up messaging. You know, part of my secret sauce is me being a slight smart ass with guests, but like being friendly and fun and having that good tone and handing that off to, you know, virtual assistants that don't communicate the same way you do. Like that was. That was scary. And I'm, you know, but now I, I still send messages on occasion, but I'm sending maybe 1% of them. I do still pay attention. Like I know I've talked to some colleagues in the industry that are like, oh yeah, I never look at messages anymore. I'm like, that's a problem. Like it doesn't mean you need to look at every message, but like my team needs to know that I'm still paying attention. And like I screenshot things and say that was the wrong answer. Uh, I can't imagine what I miss. But we have a 4.98 communication score. So we're doing something pretty good. But you, there's a continuous improvement there. So, um, you know, I have stepped away from, from that piece of it. Uh, I'm still in the accounting weeds. That's probably the hardest part 
of my business at this point is, is getting out of accounting. Like I've hired a few overseas accountants and that just has not really worked out for me well. So I just hired my first full-time accountant a couple of weeks ago and I'm in the process of onboarding that. If I can hand that off, that's going to free my time up a lot. Um, you know, my team, we've got a full-time staging designer now. We have the junior ops managers. I'm still a little bit of IT support. You know, we, we've implemented uh, a lot of different software platforms that, you know, for, despite best intentions, things don't always work as you want them to, and you got to figure out why. Sometimes it's just your team's not doing it right. Sometimes something changed. Sometimes there's just a problem. You know, smart locks can be challenging. I've always been, you know, ever since I was 10 years old, I was tech support for my mom. So I've been good at that. So <laughs> I still do that. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's that old adage of teaching someone to fish. Like I'm constantly telling my team, like I'm showing you this because if I don't, I'm stuck doing this for the rest of my life. So, you know, it's, it's, it's letting go and being comfortable letting go and having faith that you taught your people that, that they have the confidence to do it. And frankly, uh, you know, one of the phrases that I've liked, I don't remember where it comes from, but it's just fail fast. Like there's certain things that I know I'm going to hand off and someone's going to just, they're going to royally screw it up. But as long as that doesn't like knock the wheels off, I remember the times I screwed up way more than the times I haven't. And even as a consultant, when I would do my annual reviews with my, you know, with my managing directors, it was always, look, I'm pretty sure I know what I'm good at, but I don't, and I think I know what I'm not good at, but like, I need you to tell me what I can improve upon. And I want to see if I'm blind to this stuff or not. Because you remember, you know, if they tell you what you're bad at and that was a blind spot for you, I can promise you, you'll never forget it. Right. No, that makes sense. Now, I want to I wanna ask you something. With that private equity consulting background, um, I, I think that's an edge in the sense that, I mean, you, you're used to you know, long working hours, it usually gets you exposed to multiple industries and, you know, very, very, I would say like high level thinking strategy wise and whatnot. What do you, like, what have you been able to implement or put in practice in your business that comes from the fact that you had that background that you think you would not have thought of if you didn't have that kind of a background? You know, my, my background definitely is beneficial because I, you know, I, I've always had strong pattern recognition. I've worked with over a hundred companies. Typically you're not brought in to help super successful companies become slightly more successful. You're being brought in because these companies aren't operating nearly as strong as they would. So like I've been brought into situations where they're not, they're not bankrupt, but they're distressed companies or they're just not super successful. Like private equity typically buys a company to sell it in five years. And we were, we'd be brought in a lot of times in that four or fifth, fourth or fifth year to, because EBITDA didn't grow. You know, the, either the thesis failed or there was a problem in that business that didn't grow. Like if it was just a bad industry, there's not much we can do, but typically it came down to leadership in these companies that they just private equity wanted them to do more than was in their skill set. So we would, you know, our first thing that we would do is, is really interview like 30 to 50 people in these companies and figure out what was wrong with them. And then uh, distill that down into what the major core issues were. And then we'd actually go and implement that, you know, implement our findings. So it wasn't just PowerPoint consultant. We were actually fixing these companies. Mm -hmm. um, so that has helped me quickly diagnose, like, if something's not working, then I can see that. Like, if I'm seeing little glimmers of things in reviews, it's a quick, like, okay, something's going sideways. How do we fix it? Is it a person problem? Is it a process problem? Is it just this house sucks and we got to fix that particular house? Like, you know, what, what is it and how do we, how do we be proactive and have, you know, we have a plan for that again next year. Like something simple and stupid in Pittsburgh is we have these, we have these tiny ants that show up in the spring and like, they will get into 60 or 70% of the houses. It is not a pest problem per se. It's just when it gets warm, they swarm. And like, these are like, you know, eighth inch long ants and they will get in any crack. So like we just started stocking ant traps in places like in the winter so that if ants started showing off our cleaners, we didn't have to like run our team to drop off emergency ant killer because it's, hey, it's under the sink, put it by those ants and they will eat it. If a guest says something, it's like, hey, Look, 
this is this is the thing in Pittsburgh. Like you can get into a little bit of a science thing of like, this is what's happening right now. This is what you're seeing. It'll go away soon kind of thing versus like, oh my God, the world is ending because I have four ants in the house and you got to come over immediately and treat it. And this is gross. Like the first few years, like that was happening and now we've got a plan for it. And like, you know, guests will mention it on occasion, but it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's, it's trying to notice patterns and, come up with a plan so that that doesn't happen again. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned pattern recognition. You mentioned also like trying to understand if if it's a people problem, a person like a like a process problem or whatnot. That 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 uh, talent component is crucial for for any business. Yeah, uh, this is not the exception. What are your you know what's your process or or what's what's a rule of thumb that you that you like to use or how do you approach it when you're seeing something not being done the right way how do you how do you diagnose whether you know it's a people problem the person needs to be replaced or you know maybe they just need better coaching maybe they just need better uh procedures like how do you how do you draw that line it's a good question like you know we Going back to what I said a little bit ago about like hiring before you need them, uh, I think we've made some desperation hires over the years. Like we need somebody now, and you know, I've even though I've always said like hire slow and fire fast, we've we've hired a little faster than we should, and we fired a little slower than we should. Like this job is not for everybody. Like everybody listening to this in the industry knows, like hospitality is hard. You're dealing with a lot of different people. It's a 24 seven environment. Like things go wrong. You can't plan for everything. Like we've hired some people that just, they like to know what they were doing today. And that guest that had a problem now screwed up their day and they just spiral. So it's really trying a lot harder to hire the right people out of the gate. Like what I tell people in interviews now is I'm going to try to scare you off. Like, I want you to know that this job isn't for you after this call. Like, if you're still interested after this, then cool. But like, you know, I definitely tell them like, this job's going to suck sometimes. Like, it's going to be frantic sometimes. A cleaner's not going to show up and you're not going to notice until three o'clock, but we got a four o'clock coming. Like, it's all hands on deck. You're scrubbing toilets with three other people. Like, some people just don't understand that of this industry or that's not what they want. And they, you know, they don't want to answer questions at six o'clock because they're, you know, it's, it's, they're off. It's not like I'm expecting my team to work 24 seven, you know, we, they still get two days off a week. We offer 28 days off per year. Like we are, we, I want people to recharge, but when you're on, you're on. So, um, if we're seeing typically most of our issues have come from things where people have started to slack off and we, you, we, we couldn't, we couldn't fire them because we didn't have a backup plan yet. Like, and they were like the devil, you know, so it was better to have them than not have anybody at all because we were too busy. But yeah. we, we did that for a little too long. Now it's like, if a person's not a good fit, like we're better off just, we're better off just having them leave and uh, picking up their slack till we get somebody else in. So we are doing a lot more of like part-time 1099 type workers now um, and screening to see who can actually hack this and who's enjoying this and who we enjoy mm. being around. So that if somebody, if somebody's not a good fit or we just need to hire somebody because we've got an opportunity to get, you know, 20 more properties or something like that. Like we already have somebody in the wings versus like, Oh crap, we don't, we don't, we're not ready for this kind of thing. Got it. Okay. So, goes back to being a little bit more proactive on the hiring side, hiring before you need them, like asking yourself, who is it that you're going to need six months from now? And then maybe, you know, take a little bit longer to to find the right individual, not not commit to something full time right away, but test right. the waters first. I think that's the last great. three people we've hired, we've hired as 1099s for the first month. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. to see like are you are you a good and you know you 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 pitch it to them the same way like hey i don't know if this is the right job for you any more than the other way around like we haven't done this before this is different you know we, we think we're getting better at the hiring profile um but it's 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 not easy and we're a small business you know i can't throw around you know 
four hundred thousand dollar salaries for these jobs. So they're not they're not necessarily entry level. I think, especially in my market, we pay very competitively and have good benefits. But like these aren't these really aren't six figure jobs at this point. I hope they are as we continue to grow. We're looking for people. I'm looking for people that want a career, not a job. Is really what it comes down to. And I think everybody, everybody that is hiring for their core team needs to be looking for people that are looking for a career. Doesn't mean a 30 year career. You know, we're especially like you know the the millennial generation and under. Like we're not the boomer generation that wants to work somewhere for 30 years and re, you know start their job and retire. Like my my grandfather is uh, he's 93 years old and he's uh, he's still farming. And uh, this was when I left my first firm to go to A and M. He, uh, I told him, I was like, "Pap, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm leaving this company and going to the other one." And I'm like, "I'm gonna make like 150 thousand a year." And he's like, "Oh, that's real nice." And I was like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "They were nice enough to give you a job, and and you're just leaving them." I'm like, "I literally doubled my salary." He's like, "But they gave you a job." <laughs> It's just, it's a wild mindset, you know? So our gen, like our, the, the younger generations, like I tell people, I'm like, look, this doesn't need to be 10 years, but like, give me three to five at least. Like, I hope you want to stay longer, but while you're here, I'm going to teach you a lot and you're going to have access to obviously to me and I'm going to, you're going to learn because a growing company, you learn lessons quickly. Like if you go work for a company that's got 25,000 people in it, you're not exposed to much of anything outside of that real small niche that you're in, but you know, a small company like ours, like you have access to every function, like a small business has just as much complexity as a big business from like the key business functions from HR and marketing and sales and all of that. Like that exists, whether you're a 10 person company or a 10,000 person company. Because of that mindset that, that younger generations have where they, they don't see themselves you know, staying that long uh, with a certain company, I think that talent retention is also crucial, right? Yeah. So, um, what what have you learned about? Uh, I mean, I, I know that uh, private equity is also big on that. Uh, how, how what have you applied, or or what do you do to try to keep your team engaged and and try to you know once you've hired them, how do you how do you go about making sure that they actually stay around? You know, our, our, most of our cleaners have been with us since the, kind of the beginning. You know, we keep adding them, but either they, either they make it or they're gone in the first month. Um, all of my cleaners are 1099. This is a tough industry to hire full time cleaners. So we've done it that way. Um, but it's, it's being fair. It's treating people well. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be nice all the time. Sometimes you have to be a little blunt and mm -hmm. tell them what they screwed up. Uh, but, it's it's being being fair and being a good boss you know it's not necessarily like you've got to be best friends but in a small company like this like i do want to make sure that people know that we care about them and we know like they i want good job satisfaction i want them to be having fun like we have like i think every company should have their their um you know their their key kind of metrics you know we've we've got we've got our you know, we've got our moto, we've got our, our various, like, this is what host wise is, you know, one of our key tenants is fun. Like it actually comes from my firm. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I can't remember exactly how I have a phrase now, but it's like, love what you do and love who you do it with. Like mm. if you don't, like, if this is just a job, you should leave now because life is short. And if you're just working a job, that, that sucks. Like I had a job, my first job out of school, I was the lab technician for a chemical company. And I always joke that was my office space job. Like every day was the worst day of my life. Like, you know, we, we only have, you know, we only have so many years on this planet. So if you're doing a job that, that, that sucks, like you should go find something else. There's, there's something else out there for you. That's better. It can be scary. And I do, you know, I see that now, like I'm 41. I've, I've got a lot of friends that I feel like, a lot of successful friends, but then I have friends that are just stuck in jobs, but they're afraid to look for something else because they get a little bit too comfortable. And that's, that's okay. Right. Like if, if you take comfort over however you, def you know, some people define their success by being comfortable. Um, so not everybody needs to have a 30 to $50 million business. Like if, if success to you is, is owning a house and having two kids and making six figures, like you're, you're successful, potentially more successful than I am, you know, 
But um, I think there's a lot of people that have those dead end, boring jobs that suck. And, you know, they, they work until they're 65 and then they die at 66. Like we only get one crack at this. Like, even if you're spiritual, like your, your spiritual life is different than your, your, your earth life here. So like make, make smart moves because you spend, you spend way too much of your awake time working. Absolutely. No, I love it. Now, what's the grand plan uh, moving forward? Uh, what's what what does the roadmap look like uh, to go from where you're at now to, you know, the the the, the valuation you have in mind, the, the the volume of of inventory that you have in mind? How do you it, see it in terms of stages that that you know you have ahead of you? You know, we we've I've been I've been saying for the last year like I need to I need to replace my COO, and that's not to mean like I need to replace her. It's that I need to find somebody that can operate at her level in our market so that we can take her and move her to new markets. So we we found that person. We're, we're confident of that. It's managing my team's burnout because this is a hard job and growing like this isn't easy. So I have to remind people to take a freaking vacation and the work, you know, it will be here, you know, that they can... They can go away for a week and the wheels aren't going to fall off that bad. Um, so, you know, the, the, the growth plan is really focusing on these new markets and actually spending a little bit of advertising dollars to introduce hostwise into new markets. And from a finding owner perspective, as well as potentially finding these smaller operators that are looking for a way out or, you know, potentially looking for a way to grow, right? Like there's nothing wrong with, with going from being a single operator entrepreneur to working for an entrepreneurial business. Like in a lot of ways, you can get a lot further ahead faster that way, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's looking for those people. Like my I need to reinvest in my website. We we have not we have not invested in our booking site and our websites. Like I built them, you know. I I've, I've had a guy that built the frame and I did it. And I am not a web designer, so my website's great given my lack of skill set, but it's not where I need it to be. So it's really just investing in that and then using that to start driving marketing for both. You know, I. The business is hostwise.co. I, I have the .co because someone in Portugal bought the .com before I existed. Also happens to be a short-term rental operator. Um, they won $100,000 for the website now. And I said, Dad, I'll die before I spend that money on it. So we also have hostwisestays.com. Um, so we, which was also kind of strategic. I bought both websites at the same time. Like hostwise.co is the owner portal. And hostwise stays is the guest side of things. Like I always find it a little off-putting when I go to a short-term rental operator's website and there's like a whole section of like how you can make a lot of money when I'm the guest. And I'm like, that I know, like I know you're making money off of me, but like I don't I don't want to think about it. You know, it's kind of like I like hamburgers, but I don't necessarily want to hang out in the slaughterhouse. So <laughs> we we use hostwisestays.com um to to drive the, you know, drive guests. Um to, to our site and then use hostwise.co to drive owners. That makes sense. And just two, two last questions. One is you mentioned earlier, I mean, talking about advertising, that so far you haven't spent any money on advertising and, and you have to reject 80% of, of uh, the potential owners that come your way and that if anything, you, you don't have a leads problem uh, as far as lacking leads, like you have too many of them. So yeah. What would you attribute that to? Because I mean, that's a great problem to have, but I'm not sure everyone has that, you know, bit of a problem. A big part of it is is our quality level, right? Like, if you see somebody that's got eleven thousand reviews and every listing you look at is a guest favorites, and you read the reviews, like, we can all pretend that Airbnb is not like the 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 be all end all in this industry, and I think we people are getting more diversified and better at kind of escaping those, those, those reins a little bit. But I mean, Airbnb is the, the best advertisement for us because people find us through there. They see, they see the Hostwise logo on the listing page. Um, and then they, you know, they Google us and find us and send us a message. So you see our logo everywhere in, our, in the market. And it's like, what, what is this guy all about? And then you start reading more and it's like, okay, like these guys are good at what they do. Like, let me call them. And our landing pages are good. Like we explain what the business does and how we do it. You know, we've invested in 
the one marketing thing I have invested in is I, I have a registered trademark for chore free checkout. So like I, you know, when all this stuff happened in 2021, where people were complaining and the news was people complaining about chores, I was, I had this like aha moment. I'm like, we've never had chores. So like we were a chore free experience. And I started playing with that a little bit. And there was like, you know, I kicked around a bunch of different names and, you know, you could go easy, like no chores, but like, I was like, I gotta, I gotta have something that I can actually get a trademark through on. So I came up with this chore free checkout concept and um, got the registered trademark for it. So I'm the only one in the country that can use chore free checkout. Uh, if you do, you're, you're infringing. If you use a variation of it, interestingly enough, you're also infringing on my trademark. So you can, you can trademark something, try to trademark something that has like, chore and checkout in it and the patent office will say no so i'm currently involved in a little bit of litigation not my doing someone someone is trying to cancel my trademark because of the fact that they want to use a variation of my phrase on their website and the trademark office says you have a trademark it'd be like having a trademark for shoes like like you have just do it and and you have a you try to trademark let's do it like you, you're not going to get it through. It's too close to the same thing. So that was a smart Interesting. Move. But, but wait, let me, let me, let me understand, like, because I get the concept, but like, how, how does that end up helping you out uh, marketing wise? Or like, what was the, what was it? Well, because I can, how, you know, you make, yeah. as a guest, one of the issues you still have, like when we go back to the beginning of this is like, I hope that the place is clean and everything, but you also have this, like, I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to clean the house when I check out. Yeah. And there's there there are a lot of operators that still require stuff like that. So, you know, we lead with where, you know, we always offer a chore-free checkout experience. Like you check in, have a great time, you check out. Doesn't mean you can destroy the place, right? Like there's there's obviously like some caveats to this. You can't trash the home and mm-hmm. that's it. But like you don't have to wash, you know, you don't have to wash the sheets or strip the beds or take the trash mm-hmm. out or anything like that. It's just like you know, lock the door. If you loaded the dishwasher, hit start. If you didn't, no big deal, and you leave. So, from a guest mm-hmm. experience perspective, um, that is, I think, valuable. And then, you know, maybe I'm I'm sure I'm biased, but if I'm an owner and I'm looking at that and I see that okay, this company actually has a registered trademark, like on their name and on a phrase, like that's these that's a real business. Like they're they're mm-hmm. they're taking this seriously. And obviously, my when I talk to potential clients, like I'm still the sales guy, like I lead with, I was, you know, I was at the firm. I had a great job. I left the, I left the firm to do this. I didn't do this as a hobby. Like I'm doing this to kick ass and build a really strong brand and a great, um, you know, a great business. And that, that resonates with, uh, with potential clients really well. Got it. Okay. That's interesting. And, and, and last, last question, cause this has been so interesting. I, I could, I could go on. But uh, I also got to be conscious of time. Um, you're not the only one that has attempted to build, uh, you know, a, a property management operation yeah. in the thousands of properties. And, 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 and to your point earlier, some of them have, have gone public and lost most of their valuation uh, recently. What, what have they done wrong that you are trying to keep so- in mind to do differently? I'll use the I'll use the biggest management company out there without naming names, but we all know who it is. Um, my opinion is a lot of people in this industry that are a management company. They don't actually have a brand. They might say they have a brand. They might put their brand on their website when you book it, but that brand only exists from an owner perspective. Like if I if I book a Weston and I walk into a Weston, really anywhere in the world. I know what I'm getting. I know it smells the same. I know what the bed is like. I know what the check-in process is like. Like I know what the design is kind of like. Um, it's it's familiar and it's consistent. Mm-hmm. In the short-term rental space, there's a severe lack of consistency. Like you, as a as a guest, you book property A. You have a great experience. They've got silicone utensils. They've got a well-stocked kitchen. You've got salt and pepper and olive oil and like high quality linens. I had a great time. I'm going to book with that company again. I book with them again and I book a new property and 
it's dollar store utensils. You don't even have a salt shaker in there. Like the linens are, are old microfiber. You have the world's mm-hmm. cheapest towel. That's not a brand. That's not a brand at all. Like you're just managing somebody's house. So we have taken the approach since the very beginning. We stage all of our houses. Like we are in charge. They all look unique. Like I don't want to have cookie cut or anything. I'm not going to do the yellow chair like one of the bankrupt companies used to do. Like I want my places to look unique, but those the functionality is going to be the same. Like it's the same linens. We use the same reed diffusers. We use the same communication. We have the same locks. Like we have the same software platform for the guests to interact with. Like we have the same toiletries in every place, the same coffee maker, the same coffee setup. We, every one of them has a, a cocktail kit. Um, you know, we have that, that familiarity. So whenever you book one of our properties, like, you know, that quality, you don't know what the first time, but if you, if you come back and stay with us again, like when we see that with guests of return, it's like, do you, this is like, this is great. Like this is consistent. Are all your places like this? And the answer is always, yes, yes, that's, on purpose because you need that consistency. Otherwise there's, there's zero, there's zero loyalty in this industry from a guest perspective, right? Like very few guests, they, their loyal, their loyalty is, Oh, Airbnb. Like I only book Airbnbs. Like I don't like Verbo. Like that's the dumbest thing ever, right? Like the, the, Verbo is nothing. Airbnb is nothing. They're a channel platform. Um, yeah, they have your back if something goes wrong, but if you're good at this, things aren't going wrong and your, you know, your host is taking care of you. So I want people in this industry and I think this will continue to evolve in the next 10 years. I don't know that there's going to be a bunch of brands, but like there's a reason that there are Westons and Hilton's and Hilton Garden Inns and Red Roof Inns it's because people pick a brand and stick with it. People are going to learn that Airbnb and Verbo aren't brands. They are, they are Expedia's and they are Travelocities, like in Hotels.com. Like you use them to find the brand that you want to book. I'm, I'm hoping that this industry goes that way, but it does, it's going to take a bit of a critical mass with all of us operators to get there. Like if I'm the only guy out there that has a brand that is following that, like it's going to take a lot longer than if, you know, a hundred of us have a real brand and have a brand, a, a property brand standard. Cause a lot of people, you know, going back to what we talked about at the beginning of this is like, people were so focused on growth that they took a lot of turns of houses. Like they should never be short term rentals. They have too many problems. They're just dumpy. And those are, you're stuck with those unless you mm-hmm. fire them I and mean, you should fire those houses. But if you start focusing on, okay, what does my brand actually mean? What is the profile of my guests and what is the profile of my house? You can still have a variation in there, but you know, not all of my houses are 120,000 a year house. Like some of them are only 35,000 a year house, but the, the, the core amenity package is still there. We still have the, the whole bean $22 a pound coffee and the burr grinder and Ferrani syrup, things like that. Like that stuff doesn't cost that much in the scheme of things. Um, but it's still a familiarity of brand. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. The, the standardization aspect and the challenging piece for the managers out there is that they don't they don't unless they do something differently like you're doing they don't control that part i mean yeah they all i don't give owners it. i don't give owners the choice like i tell them right out of the gate like this is what you need to have the mindset of now is that this is my house like i'm going to manage it for you you're going to make money you're not involved like which is hard if it's a second home, you know, people, like if you're in a vacate, like a traditional vacation rental market, like mm-hmm. you've got to be a little bit more flexible, but it's got to be like, look, this is the coffee maker we use. This is the French press you use. Oh, you like a Keurig? Cool. Lock it in the owner's closet. You can get it out whenever you're visiting, but we're using this because this is what we use as our brand. Um, mm-hmm. You have to have those conversations and it's not for everybody. If an owner says, I don't like that, it's be like, awesome. Like there's other people out there that will do it for you. Um, Mm -hmm. and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's not being desperate. You know, there's too many people out there that are like desperate and it's because they don't, they don't really have a compelling offer. Like I manage your house for you. Like that's my, that's my offer. Like, okay, that's a commodity. Like you have to say, I operate seven of the top 10 highest revenue properties. Like I lean on quality, but 
having a 493 isn't, I, you know, I'm not telling people that because I have a 493. I'm telling people that because if you have a 493, you are, you're much higher in the rankings list and you give people a lot more confidence to book with you. So on your slow days, whenever the market's only 22% booked, people were booking your place because it's the top rated property in the market and probably at a little bit higher of a price point too, because if you're going on vacation, like, you know, at least the demographic that I'm looking for, I'm not looking for the people that are trying to book the cheapest place in my market. I want people that want to book the nicest place in their market. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. Focusing on product, focusing on quality, using uh, the results from that focus in quality as far as reviews goes to have an offer that's unique so that then you can have the leverage to set the rules and take control on you know what happens within the property and that's what i think a lot of property managers have a hard time doing yeah which... it's like differentiation right like every business needs to differentiate themselves i don't think that this industry so far has done a good job differentiating themselves at all uh, partially because it's a very, very fragmented market. I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of hosts and some of them are single shingle and some of them have a thousand units and everything in between. The barrier to entry mm -hmm. is almost nothing. And the guests, consumers, so they, they, they haven't figured it out yet either, you know, because they're, it's hard because there aren't enough brands out there to actually book. So to them, the brand is still Airbnb. I'm booking, I'm booking an Airbnb. And until that mindset changes, which is going to take time. Um, and frankly, the channels aren't, they're not excited about that. Like Airbnb doesn't want to, they don't want to tout. Host the opposite. Not yeah, all. Exactly. They're, they're, they want to make us as commoditized as possible because they make money. As long as somebody books on their platform, they don't give a shit about me, you know, to the extent that I provide a quality experience and the guest comes back, they do, but there's no loyalty to me. And that's not a knock against them. If I was, if I was advising them, I would tell them to do what they're doing. Like Airbnb's, they, they have done an amazing job of, of teaching the consumer that the Airbnb experience is the one that you want to have. But it's our job as operators to teach the guests of like Airbnb is great at introducing you to the concept of short-term rentals, but now you need to focus on finding quality hosts like us and not rolling the dice every time you get on Airbnb and Verbo. Because that's what you do right now. You roll the dice every time you book one on that site with the a, with a unknown hopes, in my opinion. That is so interesting. I really, I'm really excited, uh, Chad, to follow along uh, the, the journey of, of you guys and, and see how you, you build that brand. So yeah, thank you so much for your time. And this has been really insightful. There's been a lot of uh, golden nuggets here that I'm sure are gonna help a lot of operators out there. Where, where can people stay in touch? Uh, Anybody that wants to get in touch can go to hostwise.co and send me a message. Obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram as hostwiseco. Um, reach out. I'm always happy to, you know, converse. This is a this is a small industry at the end of the day, you know, like it's it's a big industry, but it's so fragmented that all of us are trying to figure figure it out day by day. And that's what makes it fun. Makes it frustrating sometimes, but it's fun too. Like Every time you go to Verma or one of these conferences, it's like, what is that software? Like, where did that company come from? Like, it is a, it is a rapidly changing industry, and that's what makes it so much fun. And I, as I think you can tell, I get, I have a passion for it. I find it, I find it, just fascinating uh, of of an industry. It is, man. It is, and 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 yes, it, you can you can tell the passion is there. So. Again, thank you so much for being so generous with your with your tips, your insight, and your time. And I, I look forward to seeing you soon, man. Hopefully in, in, in Verma in, in Phoenix coming up. Sounds good. Appreciate the opportunity. All right.